Lord be with you. And also with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Lord Jesus said to Nicodemus, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might have that the world might be saved through him. The one who believes in the Son is not condemned. The one who does not believe has already been condemned for refusing to believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Of the reality that we experience 
in this category of being called humanity. I guess what we could truly say is that human life is a great mystery. My wife often thinks of me as some kind of great mystery. <laughs> and for sure, my wife is a great mystery to me. Even she though I experience... Oh, yes. <laughs> what were you saying? I said I take that as a compliment. Yes, it is. So even though I experience my wife and she experiences me, I can say only so much about that experience because the experience itself exceeds my ability to explain. Try to explain what love is. We can make some suggestions about the reality, but whatever we say about love surely falls short of that which we experience in a deeply personal and intimate human relationship. So first of all, it's important for us to recognize that the word God is a designation of kind and not a personal name. And all the peoples of the world throughout history have had different ideas of what God is like. But the God of the Bible is outstanding in that it describes to us a God who is personal. And to be personal is to be relational. And in fact, I cannot be a person unless I'm in relationship with other persons, or at least one other person. So my existence as a person is wholly dependent upon being in relationship with others. I do not exist in isolation. I do not exist apart from the rest of the uh, species known as Homo sapiens. I belong to a great community of humanity, and our humanity is woven together in such a way that we are persons because we are in relationship with other persons. We receive our own self-identity from others around us. That is why we say that you cannot be a follower of Jesus apart from community. I know you heard it said, and it is, it is partly true, but not entirely true, that I must uh, accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Have you heard that, especially from some of your evangelical friends? That is true. We as Catholics can affirm that. There is a point in time which I personally must make a decision of whether or not I will follow Jesus. But the fact of the matter is, it is absolutely impossible for me to be a follower of Jesus apart from community. His teachings only have relevance in the context of relationships with others. And that's why you're here this morning. We express our faith together, um, even though it's a deeply personal thing, it is also a communal experience. That's why we need each other. That's why we can say we belong to each other. And we ultimately belong to each other because we belong to God. Now, I've spoken about humanity. And as you will notice that uh, in this category of being called humanity, there are at least in this room, I would say, about 60 persons, right? One humanity, but 60 people share equally in that reality. I'm not more human than you. You're just as human to me. So I carry within me the fullness of what it is to be human just as you do. So the human life, the human organism is made up nowadays, I think it's close to five billion people. Seven billion? Seven billion? Oh, I'm glad someone knew. <laughs> and it keeps growing. <laughs> and we come into all kinds of specific, particular characteristics. There is a great variety among us, and that adds only to the beauty of the human race, the rich diversity of who we are as human beings. There are all kinds of us that are sitting in this room, and there's even more uh, uh, variety and diversity of the human species in the world. Now, let us use this by way of analogy to talk about divinity. 
God or divinity is a form of life. In fact, it is the source of life. It is the ultimate being. And within the divine life, there is a multiplicity of three eternal persons. Each one are fully divine. Each one exists in relationship to each other. I know this seems very theological to you, but I think what we're ultimately saying as Christians is that God is not an isolated being, but rather within the divine life itself, there is three eternal persons. That's why we can say that God is personal. God is personal because God has relationships within the life of the Blessed Trinity. God is ultimately a community of persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so when we speak of God, we are talking about that which is eternal, which is ultimately relationship and persons. Now notice this icon of the Blessed Trinity. What do you see there? What do these creatures look like to you? They're angels. And uh, the iconographer, who was a Russian, uh, we say he wrote this icon. You know, uh, in normal language we say he was a painter who painted this icon. And it, it is true technically, I guess he painted the icon. But iconographers would never use that expression. Iconographers would say they wrote an icon. Why? Because in the early ancient church, icons were the way that the narrative was told to others. And so basically what the artist is doing is writing a script, almost like hieroglyphics, uh, graphic art. It is a way of expressing the gospel to the faithful through these holy uh, images that we have that adorn our church. You'll notice something else about this icon of the Blessed Trinity. It's three angelic beings. So the iconographer, by the way, his name was Rublev. He lived in the 1700s, in, back in the days of Imperial Russia. And he wrote this icon. And now it is spread all throughout the world, and you can find it in many diverse places. Because it's really ingenious. He's basing it upon the story of the appearance of a God whose name was Yahweh. And Yahweh appeared 4,000 years ago to a man in the ancient Middle East by the name of Abraham. And the way that God appeared to Abraham is that Abraham on a hot day was sitting outside his tent under the oak trees there in the land of Canaan, which we call the Holy Land. And three strangers approached him. When the three strangers approached him, Abraham got up immediately to welcome them to his abode. For Abraham was known for his great and warm hospitality. He gave instructions to his wife and his servants to prepare a feast for these guests. He washed their feet and gave them water to drink and then set before them a lavish meal. And then the three strangers entered into conversation with Abraham. You're familiar with this story. And as Abraham is having conversation with them, he addresses all three of them as Yahweh, as Lord, in the singular. Isn't that interesting? So here are these three persons, strangers, that sit down and have a meal with Abraham. And so they sat around the table. Well, Rublev now pictures this in this holy icon, that historic event, as a way of expressing that which is beyond human comprehension, the mystery of the divine life as being relational and communal. Not only that, but John, the uh, writer of the gospel, in his first letter to the church, described God in these words. 
God is love. How many have heard that? Now, I want you to know something. Love is not a noun. <clears throat> love is a verb. The experience of love is a dynamic action between persons. And when we say God is love, or when John says God is love, he's saying something about the inner life of God. That the three persons of the Holy Trinity, of the ultimate reality, that divine life, is in a constant relationship eternally with one another in perfect love. They live in perfect harmony with one another. They are in perfect communion with one another. And this is symbolized by the table. And the three angels, well, their heads are tilted to one another. And they're making gestures with their hands. So these are not just angels sitting there. They are engaged in conversation. Conversation is the evidence of relationship and of being a person. Sometimes I'm convinced that when I come home, the first person that I have a conversation with is my cat. <laughs> I do. I love cats. Oh, my cats. Amen. So do I. Amen. So I have this relationship with this cat. And any cat owner will tell you they are definitely their own persons. And we have the conversations because this cat will meow at me constantly in order to manipulate me to do something that she desires. <laughs> kind of like being married. <laughs> so, so this cat meows at me, and I heard the other day that cats don't meow to each other. Cats don't meow at other cats. Have you heard this? They meow with human beings because they're imitating us. They're entering into conversation with us. So in a way, by being in relationship with us, we are imparting to them the realization that they are persons too. And yes, I believe all cats go to heaven along with all dogs. Okay. So anyway, I want to say more about this lofty uh, understanding of the Trinity that's presented to us here. So from the, this side of the image, you have the angel dressed in gold. That represents God the Father. How do I know that? Well, the artist put in a clue. Behind the first angel, God the Father, there is a house, and it's a big house. And it's because we associate the words of Jesus concerning the Father in my Father's house. There are many dwelling places. See, there's a room for you, and there's a different room for me. We all have a dwelling place in the house of the Father. So the house here represents the Father, and it's behind the first angel. The middle angel is wearing a crimson red robe. Do you notice that? That stands for Jesus. He wears the color red because he shed his blood. The blood of the martyrs is always red. Passion Sunday, we decorate the church in red. So this represents God, the eternal Son, or the Word of God. And behind him, the artist gives us a clue. There's a tree. Why would a tree be behind the, uh, the image that represents Christ? Do you have an idea? Christmas and Christianity. That's right. The crucifixion. The cross is often called a tree in Scripture. And he would offer his life upon a tree. And then... The third angelic being here, this stranger, is the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit, you'll notice that she is wearing green. Green is the symbol of life. And we say that the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. And finally, in the background, to give us a clue, there is a mountain peak behind the, the angelic being that represents the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Because in biblical times, the Holy Spirit would be manifest as a great cloud of smoke on top of holy mountains, like Mount Horeb, 
or Mount Tabor, the Mount of Transfiguration. That's the Shekinah glory. That is the presence of the Spirit. And they're sitting at a four-sided table. And on the middle, on the table, is a bowl. A bowl or a chalice. And if you look carefully within the chalice, there's the head of a bowl. Or, yes, the head of a bowl. Sounds rather grisly, isn't it? The bull was a sacrificial victim. And so the father is gesturing towards the bull, and Jesus is blessing the bull, which is a prophetic foreshadowing of his crucifixion. And so this icon begins to tell us a story, and it begins to let us know the meaning of the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But there were three persons here, but there is four sides to the table. The reason Rublev made it a four-sided four table was because the one side of the table that seems to be empty is actually facing you, the viewer. Because humanity is the fourth person at this table. You are welcome to come and join in the Trinitarian life of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are invited to be in conversation with God, to be in communion with God. It is the divine life of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that extends an invitation to all of humanity because divinity is the lover of humanity. That's why we, what we mean when we say, smile, God loves you. God is inviting the entire human race to his table. And every Sunday when we come into this sacred space that's dedicated to prayer and divine and holy worship, we have in the center of the church a table. And it's the Lord's table. And it's a table that has a place for everyone. And we are called to take our place at the table and enter into the eternal conversation of the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So as Christians, when we think of our own notion and our own experience of God, we think of God as community. We think of God as being personal. And it's not a closed community. God has issued an invitation to all of humanity to participate in this feast of holy communion, holy conversation. And that, I think, is the gospel of the Lord. Amen. Now I have another revelation to give to you. This icon was gifted to our church by uh, Brian and Jerry Ann uh, Massetta and uh, their, uh, Jerry Ann's mother, Ann. And we're not going to bless this icon, but I would like to invite Brian and Ann if they would come forward to hold the icon that they have donated for the church. And we'll bless you along with this holy icon. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out where we're going to hang it. <laughs> and it's going to stay there. Okay. Uh, first of all, we, we thank you, uh, Brian, and your wife, Karen, for uh, gifting the church with this beautiful icon of the Blessed Trinity. And why don't we just say thank you? Thank you. Year ago, I remember this similar homily, and then and Father Peter didn't have the, the both the uh, proud of the famous um, icon here, so I decided we really need to have one. And um, we're getting close to this homily, and, and I saw this on Amazon and thought, wow, this is really fit in with uh, the decor here. And uh, <laughs> I just think that my simple dedication is that when I look at it, as Father Peter said, we're all invited to, to join the Trinitarian community of life. And, and so I'd like to dedicate to everybody in the church that helps us all to feel welcome. Our parish council, our different ministries, everybody does their part to help everybody feel part of the, the church in life. Well, thank you. Thank you. So now we uh, ask the Lord to bless this holy icon. Uh, may it inspire faith in us. And may it help us understand that God is love and that we are all invited to his table, the table of the Lord. So we bless this icon. 
to be a window of heaven to our community. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And we also bless Brian, and by extension, his wife, Jerry Ann, and also his mother, Lonnie Ann. Will <laughs> <laughs> you stand there holding up while you are litany? Let us stand now and profess our faith. 